gave him a standing ovation a few minutes ago because under his leadership, his company, Intersuit Group, has diversified its business, broadened its, its distribution channels, and expanded into new markets, delivering strong growth in revenue and profits as one of the continent-wide pioneers in payments and payment systems. He is an electrical and electronic engineer from the University of Benin, an alumnus of IESC Wharton, CIBS Global CEO Program, and a consummate people-centric leader who believes in motivating his colleagues at InterSwitch to be confident in their value as individuals and in the value of the work that they do. He is relentless in his pursuit of sustainable value for all stakeholders. And apart from leading InterSwitch to win numerous coveted industry awards, his leadership abilities have earned him several awards as well, including the CNBC Forbes All Africa Business Leader for West Africa and the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award. Can we put our hands together for him? You may not understand how competitive and impressive the profiles of the nominees for these awards are. He enjoys mentoring young people, and that's why he's here today. And he's also a Desmond Tutu Fellow of the African Leadership Institute. Please, let's give a befitting round of applause for our keynote speaker, the founder and CEO of InterSwitch Group, Mr. Mitchell Elegbe. Keep clapping and the payment transaction may get to your phone in a few minutes. Your Excellency, Senator Lee L. Moke, founder of the Bridge Institute, the, the Bridge Foundation, sorry. Your Excellency, the Governor of Imo State, Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, first, I think I want to say a very big thank you to Adewale for that recognition. It was uh, something I didn't quite expect, but I can understand where he's coming from, and I thank him for that. Today, my task is simple. I've been asked to prepare a keynote address on technology and innovation, opportunities, challenges, and the future. Let me start by saying that I'm very, very happy to be here. I apologize for coming just today. Uh, as you all know, some of us have our day jobs that sometimes does not allow us to move around freely. But I'm very, very happy that I was able to make it to Calabar this morning. This is a state that um, we hold very dear. A lot of the innovations we've carried out in this country, we have done in this state, especially under the leadership of uh, Governor Imoke then, when he was Governor of the state, and which led to us having a joint venture with the state actually, which was a model that we had hoped to recreate in other parts of the country, but which somehow we didn't quite succeed in doing. Now having said that, it is good to look at what technology is and what is innovation. You all know that technology is applying science to solve certain challenges we find around us. While innovation basically is improving on what technology has done already. In other words, creating better ways of doing things that already we deal with in technology. However, for the purpose of this discourse today, I will assume that the term technology and innovation can be used interchangeably. Whenever I think about innovation, there's a picture that comes to my mind. If you Google up the dark continent on the internet, there's a picture you will see. It's a picture of the world taken from outer space and taken at night. And what you will find is that a lot of areas around the world is well illuminated. But there's one part of that world, that map you will see, that is fairly dark. And that part is Africa. And that is why that picture is called the Dark Continent. Many years ago, in 2002, I came across that picture on the internet. And what I saw from that picture were not the challenges of a dark continent, 
but the opportunities that such a dark continent creates for those of us who want to use technology to leapfrog. And that is how we went about it. But why are we talking about opportunities, challenges, and the future today? I'm building this around technology. We are doing this because clearly, technology has the ability, the power, to transform societies. And our society really needs to be transformed. But it is not an easy task. There are challenges. And these challenges vary from society to society. I will not attempt to list all the challenges. What I'd like to do is to inspire some of you in this room through some of our own experiences to reach out for the stars and basically begin to use technology to change our society. Many of you may not remember, some of you may, that as far back as 2000, 2001, 2002, it was common to leave your offices, go to the banks, collect tally numbers because you wanted to withdraw cash. It was common for people to go home, to, to leave the office at about noon and not return that day to work. Reason, there was a lot of queue, I closed from there. It was common in those days for people to stack lots of cash on Fridays. The banks close at four. You go to the banks on Fridays to get as much money as you can get for use over the weekend. It was common in those days for you to be in traffic going home and you are robbed because there was a high likelihood that there would be a lot of cash on you. It was common in those days for you to be at home on the weekend and you are robbed at home because there's a high tendency that the robbers will find cash with you at home. These days, we don't hear a lot of those stories. Why? We have changed it, and we changed it with technology. As at that time, when we started, power was a big issue. Power is still a big issue. Telecoms was a big issue. If you recall, the likes of MTN, um, Airtel now, just got their GSM licenses. So really, technology, telecoms was a big issue. And here we were talking about an online, real-time payment infrastructure in a place like Nigeria, where there was power failure, and where telecoms was in a very bad shape. How did we do it? It is the power of technology. Sometimes you can design out challenges if you know exactly what you're doing. We do not allow the challenges of power the challenges of telecommunications to stop us from dreaming and trying to change our society. Today, it is normal for you to do a transfer, and within a second, somebody else gets the money. You won't find that in many places in the world, but you'll find it in Nigeria. Some years ago, thank you. Some years ago, the UK that we learned from started talking about faster payments. When you start talking about faster payment, it's an, it's an indication that you accept the fact that your payment was slow. Okay? And so you are trying to make it faster. In Nigeria, we talk about instantaneous payment. We don't even talk about faster payments. Okay? We are talking about payments that can be done at the speed of thought. Despite the infrastructural challenges that we have, despite the challenges of talents and knowledge, we're able to achieve this. Technology is a leveler. Do not allow where you come from stop you from going after technology. And that is the mistake some of us make in this environment. We allow the challenges of our environment, we allow poverty, corruption, and the like to stop us from dreaming the kind of dreams we should have. We forget that actually technology is what we use to stop that. If you are worried about voting, your votes not counting, or not, not, not being made to count, how do you solve that problem? Technology. We've all heard about blockchain. Single source of truth. What are we waiting for? Single source of truth. With technology, you can eliminate rigging. It is there, but somebody has to build it. Somebody has to say, I'm pained by these issues, and therefore, I want to solve this problem. I want to build something and give it to government for free because the 
uh, the, the result you get if that technology is used far outweighs any other benefit you can get. But somebody has to do it, and technology allows you to do that. Okay? Now, but despite these huge benefits of technology, why is it so difficult for most people to embrace technology? Now, there are a few challenges. One, technology is, is in itself is so diverse. There are many technologies that can solve the same problem. And one of the things we have to learn is, of all the technologies out there, which one is the right one to choose? Sometimes when you have too much choice to make, selecting the correct one becomes a problem in itself. Now, for those of you who study technology and how technology develops, you would have come across what we call the hype curve. Meaning that sometimes certain technologies start off, there's a lot of noise around it. A lot of people are talking about how wonderful this technology is. A lot of money is going to investment in this technology, but the benefits don't materialize. Okay? And then you suddenly see what we call the trough of the solution, where everybody starts to abandon it. Usually, when people begin to abandon technology, it is the time innovation really starts because some people who have learned the hard way begin to understand the mistakes they have made and how they cannot use this technology to solve real world problems. And that is where the growth starts from. So if you take blockchain, for example, blockchain is a classical example. Everybody tells you blockchain can solve everything. But blockchain is not new. Blockchain has been there far back many years. It has evolved in different forms. Blockchain is just getting to that point today when people can begin to realize exactly what you can use blockchain for to drive growth and development. So understanding the best time to jump in is also critical. In a place like Africa, in Nigeria, where we don't have resources to waste, understanding the right time to jump in is critical. And the way to understand the right time to jump in is to ask the right questions. When I mentor young people, a lot of the things I get most times is that they frame the questions wrongly. If you ask the wrong question, even if you get the correct answer, and you execute correctly, you've executed the wrong thing. And so that is kind of the frustration a lot of people see. And I'll give an example. When we started InterSwitch in 2002, I had used one of the global consulting firms and we had done a business plan. We had gone to the banks. We had gotten Ford funding. We needed 400 million naira. We got 200 million naira. No problem. We got half. We could start with half. I remember December 4, 2002 in Lagos, my very first board meeting. Um, Mr. Arnold Ekwe, who was then the CEO of UBA, asked me a question. He said, Mitchell, we have invested in this company. We have invested in that company and now we're investing in your company. How do we know which one of you will lead us to the promised land? It was a very serious question for me because it was basically telling me, we have done this before, this is not new, what are you going to do differently? So when I left that board meeting and I went back to my office, I sat up to ask myself the question he asked me, what exactly are we doing? And I realized that I was actually trying to do what two or three other companies have been trying to do for many years, trying to eliminate cash. Because somebody had told me that cash, that the product of Nigeria is cash, very inefficient. And they begin to list all the inefficiencies of cash. And then suddenly, it clicks on your head that we must eliminate cash. So when I got into my office that day, I asked myself, which country in the world has eliminated cash so that I can go learn how they did it. And there was none. Immediately I knew trying to eliminate cash in Nigeria was a bloody waste of time. So I had to redesign the question. And the way to redesign the question was to look at my people. My people love cash. Why are you trying to eliminate what people love? They need this for corruption. Yes. They need it for parties. They need to spray. We love cash. So why eliminating what everybody loves? Should that be the first thing? So I have to redefine the question that cash is not a problem. The problem is the way we use cash. Focus on how cash is used 
and you will solve a problem. So while everybody was trying to introduce point of sale to eliminate cash, I said no. Nigerians need cash just in time. They need it in the right quantity, and they need it whenever they need it. Stop making them hoard cash. Hoarding of cash because they cannot get it when they want it was the problem, not cash. So today, I'm here. I don't have cash on me, but I have my card. Why? If I need cash, there's an ATM somewhere. If you stop me to rob me, you won't get anything. It's as simple as that. We must learn to use technology to solve problems. And the mistake we all make in this country is that sometimes we don't frame the question very well. And because you don't frame the question very well, you make mistakes. Let me give another example. And by the way, we did not advertise ATMs in this market. The market rushed for it. It became our biggest business. Our business was, the business plan said, we'll break even in four years. We became profitable in our second year on the back of one thing called ATMs that was supposed to give you cash just in time. Many years ago, the then chairman, thank you, the then chairman of the Federal Inland Revenue Service, Ifwe Komoigwe, called me and said, Mitchell, I have a problem. I said, Madam, what is the problem? She said, if Mr. President tells me to tell him how much we collected from tax in this country today, and I asked my people, they give me a figure. When I asked the same question the next day, I got a different figure. So I don't even trust that I know how much tax we collect. How can we solve this problem? So we began to look at the model. And then we created something, and we did not have money. And this is very, very important. When we started InterSwitch, I left school. I started InterSwitch three years after NYC. So the board meeting in December 4, 2002, was my very first board meeting in my life. I've never been in a board meeting before. I moved from being a junior engineer in a company into becoming a CEO. I had no experience. All I knew was the problem in my country and the ways to solve the problem that I wanted to focus on. So when she asked that question, we went back to the drawing board to frame the question again. And the question, what she was saying is, I want a system that can tell me who paid their tax, what amount was paid, how they paid it, who collected the money, and where's the money now. She did a solution that will answer five questions. Who paid? What did they pay for? What amount was paid? How did they pay? And who collected the money? And where's the money now? The only way you can solve that problem is with technology. So we have to build a centralized revenue collection system for federal revenue service. We didn't have the money. FRS did not have the money. The banks provided the money. And we use that to do the collections and the end fees to get their money back. Today, that solution is being used by about 30 out of the 36 state governments. It's being used by over 8,000 organizations. Okay? And it was an idea that came from just trying to solve a very simple problem. Today in Nigeria, we do over 500 million transactions monthly, electronically, using technology. Okay? And, thank you. And everything I'm talking about was built, installed, and has been maintained by Nigerians who went to the University of Benin, University of Lagos, University of Usuka, University of uh, Futa Uwera. These were things built by local talents at a time when we had no clue where technology was going. Okay? So despite the challenges that technology brings, it creates opportunities for growth and for development. Now, talking about asking the right question, another area today that there seems to be a lot of talk is about financial inclusion. 
So when you talk about financial inclusion, what problem are you trying to solve? You will hear more by money. You will hear more recently payment service bank. But the question we should ask ourselves is what problem are we trying to solve with technology? If you can define the problem very well, you will find a solution easily to solve the problem. So what I want to encourage you to do is take time to think more about the question of what problem am I trying to solve? Nobody cares if you want to get rich. If you come to me and tell me, I want to do this technology because I want to get rich, you are wasting your time. People pay you when you solve a problem for them. And so focus on the problem you want to solve and not on the fact that you want to make money. So apart from choosing the right technology, you need to also integrate that technology. And the skill set to do that integration most times is scarce. And that creates an opportunity for those of you who want to get into that space also. Securing data and privacy issues is something that we all need to contend with today. Recently, my kids were to travel, were to get, to, to get their visas, and there's now a requirement that they should provide their social media handles. So my son asked me, why are they asking for my social media handle? And I said, if I were you, better go and check your social media handle. If there's anybody there that you are following or that is following you that you cannot vouch for, better or follow them. Because the fact is, it is not a requirement for you to get a visa to some countries that you must disclose your social media handle. What that basically means that people are going to get into your conversations and find out who are you talking to. And they will tell you they have good reasons. They want to protect their country. And so they need to know. I can, if you want to come to my country, you must provide that information. So privacy issues could also hinder technology and it's something we need to contend with as we design for technology. Infrastructural challenges is one, but I keep saying we know they exist. Power is a problem, telecoms is a problem, but don't let that phase you out. Talent is a big one. I lose staff to Canada on a daily basis. I've given up. I know it's not going to stop. It's not my problem. I can't solve it. Until those who can solve that problem solve it, I have to look for other ways to deal with the issue. I'll give an example. When you build technology and the brains that build that technology suddenly leave you, you're exposed. And the best brains are leaving this country and they're going to other countries. I like the work you guys are trying to do, trying to create that talent. The only way out is for us to produce talents faster than we are losing. When initially I thought it was salary, money, that was making them to go to Canada. It's not. So my best paid engineers are leaving. They, are, they were happy. Two days ago, they filled uh, questionnaires telling you how happy they were. Two days later, they're in Canada. So it's not about happiness with the company. It's not about pay. It's about quality of life. Some of them cannot imagine this whole thing about kidnapping. You don't know where it's going to hit you next. All sorts of things have been said. So people are leaving, and guess what? The rest of us using technology are going to suffer for it. The solution is what you guys are doing. Produce more talents faster. I don't have a problem if people go abroad. It's clear to me right now that one of the products that Nigeria has to export that we may not have known before was talent. So the devaluation of the Naira has made our talent very, very interesting to foreigners. They are going to keep coming. And guess what? The guys they are getting are very good. And they're asking them, do we have more from where you are coming? I have people who have left my company. They're working for Visa. They're working for American Express. They're working for MasterCard. They're not suffering. They're not looking for jobs. As they're getting there, jobs are waiting for them. Now, I cannot come tell you that QuickTeller did not work because the engineer behind it went abroad. I have to look for a way to solve that problem. So the challenges are there. But those challenges are creating opportunities for a new set of people to be gainfully employed. If one person leaves, somebody else has to replace them. It is our job to make sure that the person who needs to replace them has the skills, the knowledge to get the job done. And that is where training 
a lot of the things that are being done today become very, very relevant. So, without wanting to spend too much time on challenges, I'd like to spend some time on opportunities. So, for those of you who may not know, I, as, a very, as a very young engineer many years ago, I got a job with Slumberger, oil and gas sector, and I left Nigeria. I was sent to Scotland. That was my first time leaving the country. Never flown out of the country before. That was the first visa I ever got. And I thought this was my dream, playing out in front of me. If you went to the University of Benin, I did engineering, you would be a very miserable, miserable person then if you did not get involved with the oil and gas industry. You either want to work for Shell, Chevron, Mobile, or Slumberger, or Halliburton. That was our dream then. So I had to follow that, that passion too. But when I got to Scotland, I realized that this wasn't what I wanted to do. A lot of the problems that needed to have been solved have been solved. But I could see every little thing I saw there reminded me of home, of what was missing. And so after about three months, I left the job. I was being paid in dollars. I left the job and I said, I'm going back to, Lake, to, Niger to Nigeria. Came back to Lagos, started my small business that lasted for about a year. It was profitable. But after one year, I left it to my partners and I said I was going back into paid employment. Why? Two things. One, the business was not going to scale. I went to a lot of young entrepreneurs, and this, is, this message is for you. And I think, with, like my sister said earlier, sorry, I didn't get your name, but you know, she said, you don't have to know technology to be in technology. You don't have to be a software developer, you don't have to be an engineer. What you need to know is what is the problem that needs to be solved. If you know the problem, how you want to solve it, getting people to listen to you and create the solution is not difficult. So I came back to Nigeria, and here I was again in a bank branch, sweating and asking myself, what am I doing here? How come in the last three to four months I didn't suffer this thing? When I was with Slumberger, my bank account was a bank in the US. I was working in, in the UK. I had a visa card and the internet. I did all my banking. I'm back to Lagos. I'm standing on the queue in a bank branch, sweating. And I said, this thing must stop. I didn't have banking experience. Never worked in a bank before. Never done payments before. I was just an engineer. I was in networking. But I chose a problem that was outside something I knew, which was payments. This one I can solve. We didn't have the money. Like I told you before, I had just left school, three years, so there's no savings. You could have said. I didn't come from a rich home to say my father had monies to give to me. If you have a good idea, and you can articulate it very well, you will find funding. So when you hear of young companies today raising $5 million, $10 million, it is an idea that they have that they've developed. We are in a better situation right now because the world has noticed Nigerians. Okay? We are doing stuff. People are buying our companies. They are investing. The world today for entrepreneurs in technology is a lot better than it was in our time 15 to 20 years ago. It's a lot better. But I must give a warning. A lot of companies in this tech space fail. You only read about these few successful ones. You don't know about the many that have failed. Many years ago, I used to take an interest in why things go wrong. In strategy, you will hear that sometimes knowing what not to do is more important than knowing what to do. So usually, when I want to go on a venture, I take more time to learn what I must not do. Because most times, what you must do becomes very clear. Okay? So, there are a few things that are going wrong right now, which I just want to address. Because if we lose credibility, people are collecting monies, but they're not delivering the results. And why? Simple reason. Ladies and gentlemen, Nigeria is not Silicon Valley. Cash is still king. If you get one opportunity, assume it is your only and last opportunity. 
This idea that I get some money now, I will raise more money, I raise more money. You may be lucky to raise two or three times, but if you don't build a sustainable business, using a sustainable business model, you will not survive. So as you build, assume the money you just got is the last money you will ever get because you may not get a second one. If you get a second one, you'll be lucky. Most companies I know of fail after the second raise because suddenly the investors are, more, are smarter and they're not buying your story anymore. Okay? Now, cost of study, like I said earlier, does not matter. It is spend more time to understand the challenges in your environment and have a passion to want to solve it. When you talk to people, when I saw the idea of interest switch to the banks, I first studied to First Bank. Okay? I got the opportunity to address the CEO, and I told him why I wanted to do this, what I know must be done, and I also told him what I, I wasn't quite sure of, but which I can almost learn with time. He bought the idea. It was the MD of First Bank that recruited the MD of Union Bank. So one bank recruited another bank, and that's how we started. And when it came to funding, it was the same thing. One common mistake we all make is that we assume because we don't have money, we cannot make progress. Let me surprise you. True entrepreneurs never have money. They just have ideas. It appears, I won't check this out scientifically, it appears the way the world was made is that those that have ideas, good ideas, don't usually have money. And so good idea has to meet with those who have capital. Those who have capital have no idea what to spend the money on. And those who have ideas do not have capital. So spend more time developing your ideas and sitting in front of the right people and you find out that the capital you need to take off will come. But once you get that capital, always remember that there are a lot of sacrifices you must make. And I'll give you a few that, that I made. So I was employed in a proper business. So from beginning, we didn't want to design interest switch as a one-man business. Our plan was to make it a global business, okay? So from the one, there was proper corporate governance. I had board, I had board committees, and so on and so forth. But we needed 400 million. I only got 200 million. So guess what? I used to count, and I'm not ashamed to say this, my staff know this, I used to count the number of sugar we use in the office. You can't drink tea anyhow. You have your one cup of tea in the morning, I regulate, I was the central bank, I regulate the amount of sugar we use in the business. I was cleaning my office, we had no cleaners. My staff, who were graduates, were cleaning the offices. Because if I can clean my office, who are you not to clean your office? The common areas, we apportioned. My package had an official car, but we couldn't afford the official car. So what did I do? I started using the pool car. Okay? But today, that is all history. The company became profitable in the second year and has remained profitable. The point I'm trying to make is there are enough stories in Nigeria that should encourage you to do the right thing. But what we find most times is that we want to get to point, from point A to point B, but we don't want to go through the process that takes us from point A to point B. So what do you look out for? And I'm trying to close now. What do you look out for? when you want to innovate. What kind of businesses are attractive? Okay? It's so easy to waste your time with technology. Not everything we do well. Not every model is the right model. Like I told you, I walked away from a business after one year. Simple reason, it couldn't scale. Simple reason, in the context of Nigeria, I hate a business where I finish my job I ask you to pay me for my job, and I have to be begging you to pay me when I've done the job. So it was the wrong business model. I was not going to survive. So that is why when you go to the ATM today, I collect my money immediately. I don't invoice you later. That was a learning from that business model. What was going to kill one business, I designed it out. So the banks had to trust the system, and the only way to trust that system was to give up ownership, which is another point I want to raise today. Most of you want to own your business 100%. Big mistake. You get too emotional. Yesterday, I had um, dinner with some of my new staff. I do that every quarter. I have dinner with my new staff. And they asked me the question, Mitchell, what keeps you awake at night? I said, nothing. 
Intercession is a job. Okay? There's no emotion about it. Simple common sense. We know what works. What does not work, we cut it out. What works, we encourage it. And this is because I didn't put all my life savings into it. Most of you know that the best business is the business where you use other people's money. But some of you want to own your business 100%. And you want somebody else to give you a loan so you can pay back. The person is not a bank, it's an investor. So you must be ready to give up ownership. Okay? If you don't give up ownership, the business cannot grow. I know some of you think I'm talking rubbish now. It's, it's, it's okay. But the point I'm trying to make, the discipline to grow a world-class business, at some point, every business leaves the hands of the founder. Check it out. Any bank, Apple, anyone. For you to scale, at some point, you have to reduce yourself as the founder. I'm going to, I've been going through that process for many years. Interest is not owned by me. I'm a minority shareholder. Minority, very small. But that very small is big. It's bigger than it would have been if I held onto it 100%. This is perhaps the most important lesson most of you must learn. I've seen people hold on to their businesses and it starts to shrink because they want control. Control for what? For a dying business. Okay? So that's a point I think you guys should bear in mind. Nigeria is a very useful population. Less than, more than 50% of us are below 25 years of age. That should say something to you about technology. This is the generation of mobile phones and of internet. Any technology idea you want to bring forward that does not interact with the mobile phone or the internet, think about it again. In the future, everything will be done using the mobile phone. When I was coming here, I felt ashamed holding this. Most of the guys that came out here, if you notice, while the discussion was going, everybody was on their phone. They were not chatting. That's where the notes are made. I just came from a non d road show in the U.S. All the bankers that were with me, they don't bring laptops anymore. They bring a keyboard, they hang their phone on it, and start to type on the keyboard. When they finish, they fold the keyboard, they put it in their pocket. That's where technology is going. Life is now around this thing. So if you are thinking about innovation, we talked about people building apps to talk about waste. What is the connection between apps and waste? But that is the way the world is today. So if you are thinking about anything in Nigeria, there are a few guides I'd like to give to you. One, if it's not around mobile, or if mobile is not a strong component, check your business model again. Mobile, internet, cloud, check it very well. Because scale is critical. You can be in Nigeria, and your customers are in the US. It's scale. Stop thinking about your geography, when you think of solutions. Solve your problems, but think about scaling at a global level, okay? That is what investors are looking for. Glamour sells. If it's cool, people will buy, especially if it's Nigeria. When we started many years ago, I used to be amazed how Nigerians would go to the ATMs and be taking selfies. It's cool. They just want to show their brothers and brother that people used to do shakara for us, which we have it here now. So people are going to the ATMs and taking selfies. It's cool. So you got to a stage, if you don't have an ATM card and you're not withdrawing cash from the ATM, people think there's something wrong with you. At some point, banks will ever drive you out of the bank branches. Go. If you come into a bank branch, we will charge you. Go and use the ATM. So as you think about technology, especially the context of Nigeria, think about glamour and what is cool. It works all the time. Don't be afraid to fail. Most people don't tell you, nobody comes out to talk about InterSwitch when InterSwitch has failed. You only hear the ones that have succeeded. InterSwitch was not my first attempt, it was actually my third. There were two other failures. But each failure is an opportunity to learn. And that's what I did. And that's why I, I told you, I think more about what must I not do, not what I must do. When my profile was being read, I was described as a people-centric leader. I took a deliberate decision 
that that is what I wanted to become. In interest which every staff, including our driver, have got shares in the business. So my drivers are multi-millionaires. You take a decision about why are you doing this? We're not in this thing for money. We're in these things to enhance the lives of people. And if you can let go of your business, giving shares to your drivers and so on and so forth is not a big deal. Once you can make that mental shift that we are all building something together, we all have the same fears. We all want to grow old and live well. We want our retirement to be good. We all have children we want to send to school. We want to send them to good schools. We want to pay school fees. We want to be able to go on vacation like every other person. We all have the same needs. So what makes you think one person deserves more than the other? Once you can make that shift of letting go, knowing fully that when you let go, more comes in, it becomes a lot easier for you. Think big. This is not my terminology, by the way. I think it was some guy in Accenture many years ago. I heard about this thing about you think big, you start small, and you scale fast. When investors want to give you money, they're asking themselves, can the business scale? Technology allows you to build businesses that scale. Think about Uber, an app, no car, be used globally. All of us are buying cars to put on the Uber platform. Uber is not buying any car. InterSwitch does not own one ATM, but we make money from every ATM. We don't own one point of sale, we make money from point of sale. We don't own your mobile phones, we make money when you use it for mobile banking. You get the point? The scale. Okay? You don't have to invest in Airbnb does not own your homes, but where you want to rent, you go use an app or you go online, but you don't own anything. The ability to connect buyers and sellers, people who have needs with those who can solve their needs, is the new world order of business. And as you think about technology, think about it from that point of view also. So when we started InterSwitch, let me tell you, let me let you into a secret. Inter means interconnect. That was phase one, connecting banks. Interactive, that was phase two, quick teller, where people can go to and do stuff to transact. Phase three, international. So the inter is interconnect, interact, then go international. Today, we're in Kenya, we're in Uganda, we're in Gambia, and there are a few other countries we want to go to. Start small, we started in Okwawo, we're now on 10 streets, 10 buildings on one street. We we'll hope to have a head office building soon. From that place in Okwawo, we serve the whole country. We're in 30 states currently. We're in a few other countries. Technology works. You just know, need to know how to use it. The future. There's a big fight going on right now between America and China. It's not about oil. In those days, when you hear this kind of thing, it used to be about oil. It's not about oil anymore. It's about technology. It's about 5G. It's about Internet of Things. It's about a world where everything is interconnected. And I just want to bust your brain with a few examples of, of some things we are working on. One of my dreams is to make you make payments without thinking about it. Okay? In other words, InterSwitch wants to make money from you without you even knowing that we're making money. And technology, and let me explain to you. When you solve people's problem, I'll give you an example. A few years ago, went to work. My wife's friend, driving past my house, called my wife and said, I suspect there's something going in your house. I think they are stealing your diesel. She saw somebody rolling 50 liters jerry can from my house to my neighbor's house. So when I came back that night, I called my security guard. I said, listen, I want to see the 50 liter jerry cans we have, because we had like three or four. And I couldn't see one. I said, where's the fourth one? He said, the neighbor borrowed it. So I called my neighbor, Aki, why are you borrowing 50 liter jerry can? Aki said, for what? I didn't borrow your jerry can. And the logger shop it all, there was a racket going on. Your security guard will take your diesel, if you have a big tank, 
put it to your jerry can, and there's another group of people who come to collect those 50 liter jerry cans. So they move from my house to my neighbor's house, and they offload it from there. You will never know. With Internet of Things today, we can do a few things. One, I want to be able to connect directly to your meters, electricity meters. As your units are going down, you will know about, I will know. Okay, you will get a message on your phone, you are running out of units of electricity. Do you want to be topped up? Or you just need to just say, okay. No pin, nothing. You top you up. You are running out of diesel at home. We have something in your tank that measures your diesel level. When your diesel level is low, you are running out of diesel. Do you want to be topped up? All you just need to do is say yes. And that is it. We are working with OVH already, Wando, where this thing is being integrated as I speak. It's Internet of Things already working in Nigeria. Okay? But that's not where it ends. What that basically means, simple science, there's no way your electricity units can be going down and your diesel can be going down at the same time. It's not possible. It's one or the other. So because I cannot track your diesel and track electricity, once it is going down, I will send you a message that I'm suspecting something funny in your house. Your diesel is going down while you have electricity. What is happening? And I can tell you the amount of diesel that has gone down. 50 liters, 40 liters, because I can measure. Now, it doesn't end there, because I must make money. I've just told you something. What is in it for me? The next thing, I will ask you a question. Would you like a picture of what is going on in your home? You say yes, of course. Two things we can do. I'm looking forward to that day where Google Maps we allow us to drill down to your home to the point that we can see pictures of what is happening. Today it is static. Tomorrow I'm hoping technology takes to a point where we can see movements. Or if that doesn't happen, I'm hoping a day we come where as part of regional security watch, estates will begin to have drones that can move within the estate, that can be deployed to your home, and a picture is taken of what is happening in your house, which I'll send to you for a small fee. You can take these examples into healthcare. We're, doing, we're about acquiring a company in healthcare. What is interest we doing in healthcare? Healthcare today is messed up. Okay? Terribly. In our country, less than 5% of Nigerians have access to health insurance. Meaning, if you fall ill today, if you don't have money to treat yourself, you may die. The system cannot work that way. You cannot have 200 million people and health insurance is not working. You should be able to contribute insurance for yourself without even thinking about it because of our population. It's simple like actuarial science. But the enabling technology infrastructure must be put in place. The company we are buying is owned by a Nigerian medical doctor in the UK. So he's not about, he's not a software developer. He saw a problem. He said, Mitchell, as a medical doctor, we are trained that there are five stages we must go through in treating people. I've looked at why treatment in Nigeria is poor. They skip two important stages. So we need to create a system that forces them to go through that stage. But in looking at what he has done, we also saw opportunities in creating other areas. Now, where we are today with healthcare is where we were many years ago with banking. Same technology can be solved. Transportation, the same thing. Recently, I saw on telly where the Minister of Transportation was lamenting how people were hoarding train tickets. Who, who does that? We don't hoard movie tickets. How can we be hoarding train tickets? Why are train tickets being sold with paper in 2019 in Nigeria? when movie tickets are sold online. There's clearly a problem there. So all of these things are things we can use technology to solve, and we are going to do them. To close, I just want to give one quick warning. Avoid what we call activity trap. Sometimes we set out to achieve goals, and we forget 
why we started the judge in the first place. It's like climbing this a ladder to, over you put the ladder over the wall. By the time you go to the top of the wall with the ladder, you realize that you put the ladder on the wrong wall. That's what we call activity trap. There's too much activity going on in technology sometimes that we begin to forget why we started the activity in the first place. And lastly, the facts always change. And when the facts change, you should be ready to change your mind. Don't keep pushing something that is not working because you have told somebody it's going to work. Sometimes it does not work. Do not be a slave to your ideas. If it's not working, be bold enough to stop, recognize that you made a mistake, go back to the drawing board and start all over again. Thank you. That was from the depth and the wealth of decades of iteration and trial and making it work. Let's give it one more time for our keynote speaker, the founder and CEO of InterSwitch Group. Thank you so much. We're going to take a few questions, just a few questions. Um, I'll take two questions from the overflow and I'll take three questions from here. All right, I don't know if we can see now. Um, the overflow, I'll take two questions from there and three questions from here. Thank you so much for this opportunity, The Bridge. My name is Ifiak Basi, I'm a poultry farmer. And I want to ask, how can startups meet the technological requirements, especially with a slim, um, um, with, with a slim amount of money or with a slim capital? Because especially in my industry, the technology is so high. To buy technology is so high. And we need it to go forward. So how can we? How can we, with, All right. with, with, with little budget, be able to get that done? Okay, so how can Thank you me. acquire technology, yeah, especially when you have limited funding? Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah. Next. Um, the man in the pink shirt, I remember. Are you from the overflow? From, from here? Okay. Yes. Your name and your question. Please. My name is Otu. I'm an IT expert. Please, I want to ask uh, about uh, the fidelity system of technology. How is it being controlled? I've heard uh, the last speaker here talks about. Uh, he, he didn't get your question. What do you mean by the fidelity system? I only know Fidelity Bank. I'm also not an <laughs> IT person. So please explain to us in plain language. What do you mean by the fidelity system? Yeah, the fidelity uh, system that channels this technology so that we will be able to get the solution that we oh, are looking for. All right, for. thank you. Shola, do you mind explaining? Do you, did you get that? Shola, do you mind explaining if you understood what he meant? I'm looking for a tech person that can interpret your question. You're looking for the fidelity of the system that guarantees the technology. I just used idea. You know, idea is need. I don't understand your question. So if you can rephrase it, you can ask any of our speakers up front. No, to save time, just ask them they would just come forward they would help us understand to save time and then we can take your question your question please good afternoon so i don't um, know what the fidelity bank system means good afternoon i'm cj classic i'm a student in university of calabar how do you let the world know exactly what is on your mind when it comes to a business that affects the okay. country system Okay, so your question is, how do you let the world know what is on your mind with respect yes. to technology and innovation? Yes, pertaining to a business that concerns the full country. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, the last time I checked, if you logged on to facebook.com, it will say, what is on your mind? So when you answer that question and type it, the world will know what is on your mind. Don't mind me, I'm just fooling around. You can go back to your seats. Um, two more persons. I asked for two questions from the overflow. Do we have them? Are they here? Please use this microphone, please. Your name and what you, your, your question is. I have, I have taken questions from four men and no woman has come forward. If there are two women who would like to ask questions, I'll take your questions. <laughs> You are not a regular participant, so I don't want to take your question. 
Um, so I'll take one. Any other woman? Just to make Grace happy. Because if I come back to that place and sit beside her, she's going to deal with me. All right, there's another woman there. Yes. Sir, please, your question. Thank you very much. My name is Amo Ekbata. Can we allow him your question, please, sir? I teach entrepreneurship. Okay. And the greatest challenge I have in teaching my students entrepreneurship is how they can bring in technology into their methods of production, okay. which will fast track production and boost wealth. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. I, I don't know if you got that. How do you apply technology to business models? Um, where are the women? You are from the overflow as well. Please come forward and let's hear your question. I'm very precise. I'm a Baba. So, sir, my question actually goes this way. How can I link the babbing industry to the um, technological world? Well, technology is very important. Disruptive technology, for the matter, is very important in innovation. My question is, how can we make sure that education breaks out of the silo such that technology becomes superimposed into our educational sector so that okay. technology <laughs> calm down uh, uh, uh. yes your okay wrap up please okay. time so that technology is not something that is hoarded in africa but something that every african citizen female male or whatsoever okay. has right. the right to just like in thank Asia. you thank you um seven questions and i'll take them in no particular order the first one talked about money to drive your ideas. So basically, how do you get the capital for the ideas that you have? Now, I think we must all recognize that we all have ideas. Okay? The world is not short of ideas. The question is, which idea is bankable? In other words, which idea will investors see here and decide that yes, this is one I want to put money on. And there's a process. And that process starts with, I have an idea. Nobody cares about your idea. Just putting it bluntly, nobody cares about your idea. People care about their problems and how you're gonna solve their problem. Okay, people care about problems they know exist that they can see if you solve them, you make lots of money, and therefore they will give you money. So the first thing you must tell people is the statement of the problem. I'm a Nigerian. The number of children that don't go to school is X percent. And it's not good. I would like to send them to school. Give me money. Nobody will give you money. Okay? That is an NGO you want to run. The idea you have is not an entrepreneurial idea, it's an NGO idea. So you're looking for donor money, you're looking for investors. However, if you come forward to say, there's a problem, I see, this problem is huge, a lot of people will be willing to pay for this problem to go away, and I have an idea of how to solve this problem. People will listen to you, at that point in time, you are not telling them what they don't know because we all know this problem. So the fact that you have an idea doesn't bring money. You need to take it down another step. The next step is you need to begin to put that your idea and the solution you have into action. And this is where a lot of people stop because they assume that to put an idea into action requires money. Sometimes it requires a story that is well told. And therefore, you need people who can assist you to develop your story, put it into what you call a sort of proof of concept, and show that you can breathe life into it. And usually, where a lot of people start from is friends and families. You take your issue to your family and your friends to say, I can solve this problem. If they believe in you, they will give you some money. Sometimes, just to prove a concept, doesn't require a lot of money. Yes, you do need money. 
Sometimes it could be because you have the skills to write some code, you can do it yourself. If you don't have the skills, or you don't have the money, you can look for people who have the skills, and you can convince them to partner with you. Okay? Now, once you can go through that stage, there are a lot of organizations today trying to help young entrepreneurs to package their ideas very well. That is where you have all these innovation hubs, these accelerators, and so on and so forth. What you may need to do is to locate one of them and go stay with them, and they can help you package it. Why? Because people who have money go after these guys because they know they are hubs for innovation. So if I want to invest money, I will look for CC Hub, for example, and go and engage them and say, listen, I would like to see the ideas that you have within your hub. And then I can begin to engage them. The likelihood that you, as one individual, can, on your own, meet a potential investor is almost zero. And that is why a lot of people don't succeed. You need to put yourself in an environment where investors will come there and you get an opportunity to pitch to them. Okay? So while it is true that you may need money, but you're not having money, it's not a reason. You just have to locate places where people who have good ideas can go to, and they can help you package the ideas and put you in touch with people who have money that may want to invest in those ideas. The second question was, how do you let the world know what is on your mind? Again, I, I like to be blunt. The world does not care about what is on your mind. It's as simple as that. Why should I worry about what is on your mind? Do you know what is on my mind? What kind of mindset. <laughs> so I think, again, if you have something on your mind, I'm taking this to me, you have an idea. And the first response I gave also applies to you. If you have a good idea, there are places you can go to and they can help you form the idea in a way that you can put it in front of a potential investor who will then take you seriously. There was this question around technology being brought into the education curriculum. Um, I'm not quite sure if that is not happening already. So let me explain, unless there's something else you have in mind. Don't forget, we, dis we define technology as the application of science to solve certain problems. Science as a subject is being taught in school. So what I'm hearing you say is they need to teach me how to apply the knowledge of science into technology, okay? Unfortunately, I can give you an answer that is not practical. So is it a good idea to know how to take science and convert it to technology? The answer is yes. Should I advise you to go to NUC to convince them? The answer is no, waste of time for now. So the best way to do that is for actually to locate yourself in communities or with groups where this is being done and you basically have to learn it. Sometimes innovation or technology is not as big as we think. Once you have the idea and you know the science, it's not difficult to translate that idea with the science you have into something tangible. Okay? So my advice would be, don't wait for school. And I'll give you an example. As a student, I have my final year project. Well, I all have final year projects. I did one. Mine was a UPS. It works. A lecturer took it. Still uses it till today, from what you told me. Question is, did I learn how to apply science to technology? The answer is yes. That was why I did a final year project. So if you can do a final year project, the university has already prepared you for how to convert science to technology because a project, I'm assuming, if you're an engineer, it's a construction of some sort. So the prototype and how to convert science to a prototype idea has been given to you already. Especially if you did your final project yourself. I know some of you don't. And if you don't, then this kind of issue comes up. But ideally, the university of an IA project is a good opportunity to convert some of this science into technology. And the tools you have usually exist within the universities today. Okay? There was this issue around protecting your ideas from investors. The, the, main, the main fact that you think 
you need to protect your ideas from investors, makes the whole thing wrong. Investors are not looking for ideas to steal. They are looking for people to back. I repeat, investors have money given to them. Their job is not to look for ideas to steal. Their job is to look for people with good ideas that they can bank on and they will buy those people with money. So stop thinking that when you sit in front of someone and you're making a pitch with your ideas, they want to steal your ideas. Nobody has that time. It's just our mentality, thinking that we should tell somebody, I want to do this, they will steal it. The people who will steal your ideas are those that don't have money. Those that have money are looking for ideas to steal, they're looking for ideas to back. So stop protecting yourself when you start with investors. Focus on what you want to do and try to convince them to give you money. Stop worrying about whether they're going to steal ideas. Do you know how many ideas they see every day? If they want to be stealing ideas, they'll be stealing ideas every second. So change that mentality. Nobody wants to steal ideas. And guess what? Who told you your idea? When we started the internet search, four companies already were in existence trying to solve the same problem. Therefore, and I knew they were trying to solve the same problem. In fact, in our case, we used the consultant that they're working with. So they can easily say internet search stole our idea. But who cares? You've been doing it. I'm doing the same thing differently, and I'm successful. You said it's still your idea. How come somebody stole the idea you already started? So we must kill this notion that people want to steal your idea. You are just limiting yourself. Nobody cares about your idea to want to steal it. If I have money, I'm looking for ideas to back someone to give money to. The question is, can I trust you? When investors look at you, they're not looking at how to steal. The question in their mind is, can I trust you? Can I give you money and be sure that this is the thing you want to do, you will do it? And my advice is focus on convincing them, yes, you can trust me. Yes, if you give me the money, I will use it for those things I told you I want to use them for. I don't worry about people stealing ideas. One of my former bosses told me once that Mitchell, even if you come with an idea and somebody steals it, you can see how the person will start to implement your ideas and learn from their mistakes. The ideas to raise your idea. Let them steal it, let them try. When they fail, you see what they have failed on. Don't repeat that one, you got to do your idea. Okay? We all knew. Okay. We all saw that people were going to banks, queuing, but that's the tally numbers. We all saw it. We all knew it's not the right way to do it. So the first trouble I brought, we know this doesn't happen in the So everybody had the idea. But who will execute is the question. Move your ideas away from ideas to execution. And stop worrying about who will steal my idea. Nobody's out there to steal ideas. There was a question of rural health. I didn't quite get that very well. Was a question how to apply technology to deal with the issues of rural health. I don't know. I don't know. Quite a bit. Oh, she wants to pitch her idea. Oh, I see. Okay, that's a separate conversation. Yeah, yeah and I think. I think that's all. I think there's one point I want to just bring out. I think one of the questions that we didn't quite interpret very well. I think. For those of you who have ideas, okay, try to locate this box that we have and see if you can get a message to one of them and work with people to develop ideas. There's nothing as bad as you have an idea and then you don't do anything about it and you see somebody else do something about it. So my advice is try and locate some of these hops that we have where they can assist you to develop those ideas. Now, even if they reject you, you know your idea was rejected because it wasn't good enough. But don't keep the idea within you and not try to bring it out. It's better for it to come out and it's rejected than for it to be within you and you don't try it out. Okay? Thank you very much. Can we put our hands together for Mr. Mitchell Legbe, the founder CEO of Interstage Group? Keep clapping as he goes back to his seat.
very insightful session. I hope you listen carefully. So many things to note, so many nudges.